Hello everyone, I am Mary Garland. This presentation about early settlers and the religions they brought into East Hants is part of a larger project I am working on about the churches in East Hants. I noted when I plotted the churches by denomination on a map of East Hants that there were distinct patterns. So I decided to examine how immigration into East Hants created the religious patterns of the area. It is important to set the background history that led to the immigration patterns in Nova Scotia. The entire northeastern seaboard of North America, known as Acadia, was first claimed by France in 1524 and remained in French hands until 1620, when it was claimed by Britain. Between 1524 and 1713, Acadia's ownership flipped between France and Britain six times, eventually coming under British control in 1713. The people of Acadia, known as Acadians, were French and remained French no matter who controlled Acadia. They were very successful farmers. They used dike agriculture to utilize the fertile tidal marshes. They also had a thriving economic base and traded with settlers in New England. Apart from the few British military establishments, the population of Nova Scotia was French and Catholic. Until they were deported starting in 1755, the Acadians prospered and their population grew quickly due to their high birth rate. They maintained and extended family system with several generations working on farms and intercommunity projects. They avoided epidemics such as typhoid, smallpox, and cholera because they lived in isolated communities. They also maintained good relations with the Mi'kmaq, mostly by not interfering with Mi'kmaq land. But throughout their tenure in Nova Scotia, neither the French nor the English were entirely satisfied with the Acadian population. The Acadians always considered themselves to be Acadian, while the French considered them to be unreliable allies, and the English considered them to be unsatisfactory citizens. In these charts, the year is marked in the horizontal axis, and the population in actual numbers is on the vertical axis. The British were nervous about having an entire population consist of French Catholics for Nova Scotia, and they wanted more English Protestant settlers. Previous efforts to populate Nova Scotia with Protestant settlers had seen mixed results. When Edward Cornwallis arrived in Chibucto in 1749 and founded Halifax, he brought with him 2,500 people from Britain but these people were not used to clearing their own land and the hard work required to establish a settlement. Cornwallis wanted Protestant settlers from Europe, and he embarked on a scheme to bring in people from Germany, Switzerland, and France called the Foreign Protestants. He wanted to integrate these new settlers among the Acadians. This idea did not work because the newcomers were not good at homesteading and the Acadians, who were very successful, didn't want them. Cornwallis left in Nova Scotia in 1752 and was replaced by Peregrine Hobson, who worked well with the Mi'kmaq and the Acadians. Problems for the Acadians climaxed when Hobson left in 1754 due to illness and was replaced by Brigadier General Charles Lawrence. Governor Lawrence wanted Acadian lands for Protestant settlers. Governor Shirley of Massachusetts was tired of border skirmishes and also wanted land for the New Englanders. The two governors decided that the only solution was to deport the Acadians. Without royal consent, they proceeded to do this starting in 1755. From 1755 to 1764, more than 12,000 Acadians were removed from their homes and lands, which essentially devastated the population of Nova Scotia. In 1759, the British finally took Quebec and France relinquished its claim on North America. Britain, however, was left with a colony bereft of any economic ability. Nova Scotia had no population to speak of, no ability to farm or maintain its economic basis, and was now a liability to Britain. Britain badly needed to re-establish a farming population within its colony. The New England population was increasing rapidly. By 1775, it was over 800,000, and although they were expanding westward, 
they were running into the Appalachian Mountains. Governors Lawrence and Shirley devised a plan to entice New Englanders to emigrate to Nova Scotia by granting them fertile farmland that once belonged to the Acadians and the promise of religious freedom. The migration of the New England planters was significant. Between 1760 and 1768, roughly 8,000 people settled into the Annapolis Valley, Upper St. John River, and some of the Acadian lands along the Minas Basin. Because the Acadian population had been decimated, the planter immigration had a much bigger effect on Nova Scotia than the previous attempts to populate the colony with Protestants. The New Englanders sent agents to scout the best land prospects, and they chose the townships of Horton, Cornwallis, and Falmouth. The planters were used to using dikes for agriculture and were very successful farmers. They brought with them their congregational religion, their multi-general community style, and made successful settlements which added to the overall makeup of Nova Scotia. The Congregational Church, with its emphasis on individuality and self-government, suited the New Englanders. They became a crucial part of the religious revival that centered on a new young preacher named Henry Alline. Henry preached a new light doctrine, a more evangelical form of congregationalism. His preaching met fertile ground with a rural population isolated from their homeland. People from Northern Ireland, known as Ulster Scots, began to flee religious persecution in Ireland by coming to Canada starting around 1760. Until the end of the 19th century, over half a million Ulster Scots arrived in Canada. The first large group settled in the Truro area and spread out from there. In East Hants, the early grants along the Bay of Fundy and Shubenacadie River were to Ulster Scots. Britain had 14 colonies in North America, 13 of which were in what became the United States, stretching from Maine to Georgia. After the last French-Indian War from 1754 to 1763, Britain needed money and began to impose taxes on its colonies. This resulted in a huge resentment within the 13 colonies. Nova Scotia didn't really resent anything. The people there just didn't care about the taxes. But the resentment escalated into open fighting. On July 4, 1776, the Continental Congress voted for independence from Britain. This started a war between Britain and the 13 colonies, as well as a war between pro-British and pro-American supporters within the colonies. The British supporters were known as Loyalists. Several regiments for the British were raised in Nova Scotia, including the 84th Regiment of Foot, 2nd Battalion, which was stationed at Fort Edward, which is now within Windsor, and commanded by Major General John Small. This regiment consisted mostly of people of Scottish descent. When the colonies won their independence from Britain with the Treaty of Paris in 1783, all Loyalists had to leave the newly created United States. They lost all their holdings in the United States and were forced to start over elsewhere. Approximately 70,000 Loyalists fled, and of these, about 30,000 immigrated to Nova Scotia, more than doubling the population. You can see from the chart how the influx of Loyalists completely swamped the existing population of Nova Scotia. By 1783, the good farmland in Hance County had been granted to the Ulster Scots and the New England planters. In an effort to find land for the huge influx of people coming into Nova Scotia, the government began to grant land in the interior, but this land was wild, uninhabited, and isolated. The Loyalists wanted their own settlements, and they petitioned the government to create separate Loyalist communities. In 1784, New Brunswick was created as its own Loyalist colony, and the townships of Douglas and Rawdon were created in Hance County for the incoming Loyalists. The disbanded Loyalist Regiment of the 84th Regiment of Foot, 2nd Battalion, and their families settled Douglas and the people rescued from Fort 96 in South Carolina settled Rodden Township. Fort 96 was in South Carolina at the western edge bordering Cherokee land and was considered backcountry. The predominant ethnic group living there was the Ulster Scots. 
Loyalists were staying within Fort 96 during the Revolution for safety. John Bond was one of those Loyalists. In 1781, General Nathaniel Green attacked Fort 96, but the fort held until Lord Rawdon and his troops rescued the trapped Loyalists and evacuated the fort. John Bond and his group from Fort 96 were among the first large group of Loyalists to enter Nova Scotia. He arrived in Halifax with 28 families and 27 men and secured 24,000 acres to be divided among the group. They settled along the Herbert River. Bond built a sawmill and supplied lumber to the new settlement. Bond was Baptist and probably responsible for establishing a Baptist following in the area. These people had a strong bond forged by shared experience before and during the war. They were neighbors at Fort 96 and neighbors now. They chose a name that reiterated their identity as a group and called their new township Rodden after the man who rescued them. The 84th Regiment of Foot 2nd Battalion, commanded by Major General John Small, was involved in rescuing the Loyalists trapped in Fort 96. In 1782, the regiment evacuated North Carolina to Halifax. When the regiment was disbanded, the soldiers and their families received land grants in the newly created Douglas Township at East Hants. The township was named for Commander-in-Chief Sir Charles Douglas, the commander of the naval station at Halifax. Major General Small received a substantial grant for his group of settlers. The grant was for almost 82,000 acres and covered land bordering the Connecticut and Nine Mile Rivers. How did these two huge land grants and influx of loyalists affect East Hants? Congregationalism had already been established in the planter townships of Falmouth, Cornwallis, and Horton. Some of the planter Congregationalists began to move towards baptism. Baptism was also brought into Nova Scotia by the loyalists. Many of the loyalists from South Carolina were Baptist. Shubael Dimock, a loyalist and friend of John Bond, built a Baptist church in Newport in 1777 probably one of the oldest still working churches in East Hants, and he offered services to both Congregationalists and Baptists. As more Loyalists poured into Nova Scotia, Congregationalism began to wane, opening the way for the spread of Baptism. Baptism spread from west to east. The more modern churches are in the south and eastern parts of East Hants. Most of the early Presbyterians in Nova Scotia were Scottish and Ulster Scott immigrants who came in the 1760s, about the same time as the planters. At the end of the American Revolution, the Presbyterian churches in Nova Scotia ceased receiving help from their American counterparts, and the Nova Scotia Presbyterians formed their own presbytery at Truro in 1786. The disbanded 84th Regiment of Foot was mainly Scottish, also bringing Presbyterianism to Douglas Township. As well, some of the New England Congregationalists converted to Presbyterianism. Methodism started as a revival movement within the Church of England. Immigrants from Yorkshire, England brought Methodism to Nova Scotia, settling in Cumberland County, starting in 1772. Methodism also had roots in the military establishments and spread into Windsor and Hants County as people heard sermons and liked what they heard. Although most planters did not like the Church of England, they were attracted to Methodism because of its ev evangelism. Methodism spread quickly because the ministers traveled extensively and the dynamic ser sermons attracted people devoid of other cultural stimulation. Methodism was strong in Rodden Township because the people there were more isolated and more familiar with the Methodist preachers who traveled there. As a British colony, the Church of England was established as a state religion since 1758. After the Revolution, the British government withdrew support for the Anglican Church in the U.S., making it difficult for American Anglicans. Loyalists, military, and British immigrants all brought Anglicanism to Nova Scotia. In 1787, Charles Inglis was appointed the Anglican Bishop of Nova Scotia, and he focused on church building. During his time, more than 20 churches were built, as well as an academy and college. In East Hants, the Anglican churches were established by the soldiers of the 84th Regiment and also by the people from Fort 96.
The congregational churches along the Knoll Shore came about from a schism within the Presbyterian Church in Douglas Township, then under the ministry of Reverend Crow. By 1856, the congregation in Maitland thought Reverend Crow was too old and requested that he resign. He refused, causing dissension amongst the congregation. The Truro Presbytery formed a second congregation under Reverend Curry within the same area, and this congregation shared the churches but worshipped at a different time. The dissension between the two groups caused grief in the communities. In 1860, Reverend Crow hired an assistant, Reverend Jacob McClellan of Parsboro. When Reverend Crow died in 1869, the people under Reverend McClellan began to turn to Congregationalism. A Congregationalist student, Mr. Hawes, took over in 1876, and he set up five congregations at Moosebrook, Selma, Knoll, Maitland, and South Maitland. When the Congregationalists were denied use of the Presbyterian churches, they built churches in Moosebrook, East Knoll, Selma, Maitland, and South Maitland. Early Catholic churches were built by the Mi'kmaq and Acadians. There is an early Catholic graveyard in Walton that could have Acadian graves. Acadians tended to mark graves with wooden crosses, which did not survive. Thus, Acadian graveyards are difficult to find. The Catholic churches on the east side of East Hans ministered to the Irish Catholics who worked the Shubenacadie Canal and to the Mi'kmaq who had converted to Catholicism. Although a small group, the Irish Catholics were prosperous and fought for Catholic rights in Nova Scotia. There were also Catholic loyalists who brought Catholicism into East Hants. The Church of Christ traces its origins to Kentucky and Virginia following the Second Great Awakening within the Protestant congregations. In East Hants, the Church of Christ's Disciples was organized from a Rod and Baptist congregation which liked the idea of the congregation ruled church. The Church of Christ in Milford is independent of the Church of Christ Disciples. In summary, when Britain gained control of Nova Scotia, it wanted to populate the colony with English-speaking Protestant settlers, but attempts to do this were not productive. When the Acadians were forcibly removed, this left an economic and cultural vacuum where there had once been a thriving, successful colony. The immigration of New England planters was more successful because the planters were good farmers and they were not facing a predominant Acadian population. Planters brought congregationalism to Nova Scotia. However, it was the massive immigration of loyalists after the American Re Revolution that had the biggest impact on Nova Scotia population, culture and religious demographics. The loyalists more than doubled the existing population and brought with them their close-knit bonds with each other, their ability to farm in rough areas, and their religions. The beauty of East Hants and Nova Scotia in general is that so many of these original church buildings dating back a hundred years or more still exist and can tell the story of who built them. This allows us to piece together who immigrated into Nova Scotia, when they came, and how their lives affected not just Nova Scotia and East Hants then, but how their contributions continue to affect our lives.